So um, about a year ago, uh, a couple of us went to visit Deep Local, uh, specifically to ask them about a relatively mundane, boring project that they were working on. <laughs> um, and two of us walked out of the building saying, uh, oh my god, this is, this is a company we need to keep track of. They do really cool, fun stuff. Um, and it was rather uh, nice to see that over the next year or so, we've been, yeah. this has been reinforced. Things have been going really interesting. I'm not going to steal any thunder from you. It's OK. Um, mm -hmm. But it's really great that we have an opportunity to get Nathan here. Um, the uh, key thing that I do want to stress, a lot of people, when they think about robotics, they think there's no way I can do anything kind of artistic or creative or fun. Um, we know from past history here around the Institute that most of us disagree with that concept, and we believe it's possible to do creative fun things, especially artistic things. Um, and so that's why, another reason why I'm happy he's here is because it gives us a chance to reinforce that. So Nathan Martin, cool. Deep Local. Thank Have you. Bye. Thanks, Aaron. All right, so um, first, I really want to say thanks to Aaron for having me, uh, and thanks for taking an hour to come here and listening to me. Um, my background, as Aaron said, is not in technology. Uh, my background's in fine arts. I went to school here for fine arts, and I was a researcher in the Studio for Creative Inquiry for a while. Um, Deep Local, we started about going on five years ago as a spin out of the Studio for Creative Inquiry. And uh, we've had a very diverse five years. It's been a lot of change along the way. And that's something we've been really good at, is sort of changing and adapting what we do. Um, we use this term loosely, gutter tech, to describe everything that we do. Um, I talk about it a lot. I use it a lot. But it really is sort of a fundamental <coughs> philosophy that we use at our company and that I've used as an artist. Um, for 10 years, I ran an art group before starting this company. And the way I ran that art group was I didn't really care about what technology I was using or what I was learning or what I was playing with. It was as long as it was interesting to me, I could be passionate about it, and I could try to solve a problem in an interesting way. Um, a lot of that comes from amateurism. I don't know if you talk about this at all, but uh, the interesting thing about artists is a lot of artists have developed or invented technology solutions in the past. Artists invent these technology solutions because they're thinking like amateurs. They're free because they have no rules or restrictions. When you learn a specialty or you become an expert, there is something that happens. Uh, you're affected by your peers, and you start to restrict the way you think about any given technology. You start to think of things or solutions as absurd or ridiculous. Um, artists don't have to do that because they're essentially um, uh, they're newbies to everything. They're just sort of asking the obvious question, stating the obvious thing. Uh, and it's something that I really take to heart with our company. So what Deep Local is, I say it a lot as well, is that we're really uh, an art group that happens to be a technology company. We have to create value for our clients, um, and we do that. Uh, but we do that as an art group. Uh, and we do that so much to a degree that we even have an artist residency program where we bring artists in because we're a victim of the same things I'm criticizing other people of. We can stop, to be innov stop being innovative as well. Once we learn a process or a way of doing things, it's hard for us to stop, think, and reinvent. But we constantly try to do that, to stop, think, and reinvent the way we do stuff. Gutter tech is a term that basically means using the lowest common denominator to solve any problem. When we're asked to think about anything, whether it's a product we're working on, or it's an experience um, for a client or for a product, we put ourselves in their shoes and start to think about, much like Aaron probably teaches here in a more um, real way, uh, we think we have to think very quickly in like days. And we think about what would it be like to be on that end. And let's just devise whatever that experience is. And if that experience involves magic, if it involves duct tape, if it involves um, robotics, it doesn't quite matter. Someone just wants the experience. They don't care about how that experience was solved, what technology was used. Um, we actually have a benefit, because a lot of what we do is we work in advertising. And I'll show you what that is. But um, this is much different than product development, because we have short-term customer support. Um, this is actually the first robot I ever built. Uh, again, self-taught uh, hardware and software engineering. This was, uh, this is 1995, 96. I'm just showing this because it's, uh, I show this a lot more in advertising circles. But this is a really simple robot that has a few servos in it, a mounted camera. Um, so it would basically move around a sand, a sandbox um, with a mounted camera point of view. People would control it over a website, and it would be able to sort of track its movement, triggering motion sensors that triggered projection, projections in the physical environment. This was an art installation, and this is what a lot, what I started to do as an individual artist. Then I uh, created an art collective. When I moved into uh, working in a collective, I realized that the stuff I was interested in doing, I couldn't necessarily teach myself. I wasn't capable. So I started to work a lot more with people that had specialties that I didn't have. And our collective sort of became a hacker collective. We spoke a lot in hacker circles at 2600 conference and a few other conferences around the world. And the first big project we built 
um, was uh, hacking the Nintendo Game Boy. So if you go back to whenever this was, 97, 98, the Game Boy was the biggest selling uh, console system. What we did was, this is all strange now to think about it in this context, but at the time we wanted to say kids are consumers of technology, kids are consumers of that media, whatever that game might be. There were about 16 different games at the time that Nintendo licensed. We wanted kids to create their own games, feel like you could build your own media rather than consume it. So we built, uh, one, our own game, but we built a development kit that basically allowed people to write their own games, write their own uh, code. We would wrote our own compiler. It, we would upload it, you know, this stuff. It's an EEPROM. We basically replaced the ROM chip with an EEPROM, um, wrote your own code, uploaded it to the cart, and used a concept called reverse stealing, which basically meant we went into the store, bought Pokemon, took it home, replaced that cartridge with our own memory chip, uploaded our game to the cartridge and took it back to the store. So a kid going to buy Pokemon instead gets our game. <laughs> um, and then we produced this development kit that included all the software, all the schematics, how to do this yourself, and published this in three different languages. Um, that's my background. So then skip ahead just to show you that because the reason I'm showing you that is that really is more than anything, what we have at Deep Local is a really interesting culture. I believe like we've taken that culture, that feeling of just we want to explore, we want to invent, and we want to feel passionate about what we're doing at all times. And we've carried that over into a company that's now faced with new challenges like, okay, now I need to pay everyone and we need to sustain ourselves. How do I make this a practice that lasts a lifetime for us and, and keep really smart people interested? And that's what I, that's what I have to do. Um, the first project that we're most known for is the Nike Chalkbot, and this was a robot basically that allowed, um, and what's interesting is it, in, about it is not the technology. What this robot allowed people to do was to participate remotely in the Tour de France um, by basically uh, recreating a, a pastime that's already done at the Tour. The Tour de France is the world's largest biking event, a uh, really cool event. Uh, a lot of people will chalk messages or to either to riders or about themselves on the grounds of the Tour. That's the history of it. Uh, Live Strong Foundation um, paid for by Nike was a big part of the Tour de France because of uh, Lance Armstrong. This system we built allowed people to send in messages uh, remotely, have those messages printed in real time or near real time on the grounds of the Tour de France. A camera system would snap a picture of the message after it printed, grab the GPS coordinates of where it printed, uh, composite a really nice image, a JPEG of that shot with your text and send it back to a user, giving them little, a little sort of memento of their, uh, their marking. Um, people sent in messages about RIP messages, lost loved ones, people who are battling or are cancer survivors, and some just wrote inspirational messages. None of it was about Lance Armstrong, none of it was about riders, that wasn't allowed, it wasn't about the riders, this was part of a campaign called It's About You, it was a really nice campaign. Um, these messages were seen by a lot of the riders themselves. Uh, we used an environmentally friendly chalk that would wash away, um, but it had this really nice effect. Uh, this is a shot done by one of Nike's photographers, but the machine was sort of housed in this nice kit. I'll give you a quick video of what we specialize in is sort of rapid prototyping. I think it's what you guys do here at school too. So after getting a call, we did this in conjunction with an advertising agency called Wyden and Kennedy uh, out of Portland and built it locally with a friend's company called Standard Robot. And this is it. Within two days, we had this. What you're seeing there is really a, a gutter tech setup. This is uh, a paint sprayer from Home Depot, some paint, some glidden paint, uh, a digital, um, a, a digital uh, solenoid valve that we wanted to use, we ended up using for all those spray heads, uh, and just and it, an encoder wheel over here to track the movement so we can turn it on and off. All this was was to prove to the client within two days, we know that you normally think this thing we're doing, I don't know if I can swear in here, but normally advertising clients think that advertising agencies come up with lots of crazy ideas. Um, we do that now, but a lot of them are not possible. So they typically, clients like Nike think that this was not a real concept. They didn't even believe it was going to work. Um, so we did this in two days to prove them, yes, we can turn on and off a digital head. We can spray paint on the ground. Um, we can move from there. And we moved into this campaign. I'll just show you, I have a few videos I'll show you. I just want to let you know that after long talks uh, with my kids, the rest of my family, close group of friends, I have decided to return to professional cycling in 2009. I am here to fight with you. I am here to I don't have to deal with it. You don't have to deal with it. None of us have to deal with it. My children don't have to deal with it. This must be a, a global health priority. We know that we cannot do this alone. I cannot guarantee an eighth tour victory, but I can guarantee you that the Livestrong message will touch all aspects of, of, of our society, all comments of our society, and certainly touch 
on all the different diseases and facets of cancer that, that, that need the attention. It's not about me. It's about my sister. It's about my dog. It's about my son. It's about sharing my story. So people can compare their stories to mine. Getting back to the mound, it was a struggle. I was on the highest mountain in the world, fighting for my life. Yeah! If I can get through six rounds of chemo, then 50 below, 100 mile an hour winds, pitch in a no hitter. Seems easy. It's about you. We built Chalkbot um, together so that people from everywhere can. This is Robot this City. If anyone's familiar and, uh, with that. Cancer survival. Um, like to a, to a, the entire world at the Tour de France um, on the streets. It's a fully pneumatic robot. We're all friends working on the development of it, so it's literally friends working together, building a really cool thing that millions of people are going to be able to see and experience and interact with. The way that people treat things changes a lot once it's physical. People will feel a lot more connected to that, to the message that they send. So it's not just a throwaway text, it's not just a Yo, I'm sorry, right? It, it, it's, you know, now it's somewhere, right? Now it's something. To print a message in sort of memoriam of uh, a lost loved one or in uh, honor of someone fighting cancer uh, and, and see that uh, appear on, on the road in the Tour de France that they could never participate in physically, that has the power to them. Um, to be very comforting, I would say. As a software person, you're just constantly cranking out HTML, you're cranking out images. He regrets that whatever. statement it's pretty heavily. that you end up with something that's uh, actually potentially really important to somebody. And so it's like a really good feeling. So, the um, reason I showed you that whole video is I talk a lot about technology sometimes, and, and I that campaign I, I, I talk a lot about a lot and one of the things is that doesn't come across is we actually were at the tour the whole time operating that machine and when you walk behind those messages as we did it really is quite moving I'd lost a friend to Hodgkin's disease right before then and his um, wife sent in a message it, it, it's really a moving thing to see so um, I got a lot of shit for working with Nike as a former artist but I gotta say it was a it was a moving experience to, to see it happen and we were really proud to be a part of it um, Nike was proud too because you know the job of these ad campaigns is to do things like increase revenue, um, get people excited about something. Um, we take the premise that uh, we don't really need to reverse engineer Twitter or, or make social media uh, clever tools. We just need to figure out how to do something that's interesting enough that people talk about to their friends. This is a very old school approach to advertising. The idea is if I just do something cool, um, 15 years ago maybe I'd pick up my phone and call my, uh, call my relatives and say have you seen this? Now you may tweet about it. It happens much faster, but the challenge is still the same. Just do something interesting. Um, so that's what I think Chalkbot did. It was something that was interesting. Um, the thing you realize with Chalkbot is, while not a lot of people were able to directly participate in something like that, 36,000 the first year, about 50,000 the second year, um, there is an impact in, in impressions later on in what's called earned media. As an artist, that's what we specialize in because we don't have any money to buy media. That's I want someone to talk about what I'm doing. Um, so that clip, that video that you saw that was sort of shot that had myself and one of our engineers in it was, uh, was shown on Versus TV. It wasn't shot to be even uh, TV broadcast ready, but it was picked up and shown during the downtime. All the cameras that covered the tour shot it from above and broadcast that. Uh, and in turn, Nike saw an increase of 46% in sales. Nike's a $16 billion company, so 46% increase is significant for them. Um, so they're happy about that. And if you want to 
go to these GPS coordinates on Google Maps uh, satellite view, you can actually see all our original printed messages that were done in real paint, um, still over in Robot City. Or if you go over there, you'll probably still see them. Um, before I move on and show you what this is, um, after that project, we developed sort of a reputation um, and a, a name was sort of given to what we do called Post Digital, which is we've sort of adopted, we're okay with it, um, but in advertising they took this on as the idea of um, how do you do something that breaks through the noise of online interaction. Instead of every ad campaign calling for you to upload video or share your story or send me a picture or do whatever it might be, these things are all clamoring for your attention. If anything, there's more noise than ever online asking for you to look at it or engage with it. The idea was you need to really give people value. It needs to have impact in the real world. I want to see something tangible. I want to see the effect, and I want to get some value for my interaction. And that's really what we've become sort of specialists in and, and, and developed some uh, notoriety for in, in this world at least. So we get asked to do some really interesting projects. Sometimes clients come to us with ideas. Um, those clients are either ad agencies or brands. And sometimes they come to us with a budget and just say, what can we do for this event or for this thing? Which is the greatest opportunity because we get to sort of sit around as a team of people, come up with an idea that we think would be fun to build, figure out if it's cool enough that people will talk about it, make sure it somehow is associated with the brand. This one is a weird one. Um, and go from there. December was a busy month for us. I'm going to show you a couple of recent projects. This, uh, I'm going to talk about time. Chocolate was a project that I should stop saying this, but it took seven weeks to go from idea to shipment. Um, so now we get tasked to do things. That was actually the longest time we've ever been given to do any of our projects. Um, and we have a team of less than 10 people. Uh, about four people worked on Chalkbot. This uh, project is called Project Reindeer. I'll show you some videos from this, but this was just done for the Gap, or Gap. I guess I just found out it's not called the Gap, it's Gap. So it was just done for Gap in uh, December. The idea was really a gimmick. Um, Gap wanted a way of having holiday promotions, in-store sales that were triggered in some new way and that involved, you know, Twitter was a goal. So we went out and basically found a reindeer farm in rural Minnesota where we sat, uh, there was no power, no internet connection. Um, we had to rig up everything sort of from scratch, you know, write some mobile apps so we could snap pictures and do everything over cellular. And we built these little units so that we could track the movement of these reindeer in real time. So basically what we did was track eight reindeer as they moved around a three-acre pasture, snapped photographs of them, and uh, sent updates to a server about where they were every 10 seconds. What this did was every reindeer had a sale attached with it. And so let's just say 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%. Each one represented some potential sale. Uh, and there's a challenge each day. Which reindeer, let's say Chloe, if Chloe walks the furthest or the closest to the North Pole or the shortest distance or whatever that challenge might be, then that sale was triggered in the stores of the Gap the following day. So I'll, it's a little complex. And we had to get stuff like this on an airplane. <laughs> but this may explain some of it. Let me go back to him. It's not the weirdest idea I've ever heard but it's close. One day, I get a call from Gap. They said they wanted my reindeer to decide which deals happen in their stores. They want to make a whole website about it. I guess that's fashion for you. A we didn't shoot the later, Some guys pull up with a whole truck full of equipment. They got cameras, computers. It's like the APIs updating. And GPS collars that connect to the internet. Before you know it, they got this place wired up like NASA. We got the first update. Still, the deer don't seem to mind. If they're happy, I'm happy. I'm not sure how this is going to end, but I'll tell you, things are getting pretty interesting. <laughs> So these nice little video spots were made. Some are funny. Um, they last for about five days. They had a few profile spots of the reindeer like this. In a busy day on the tundra, Zoe and Cooper nearly locked horns over a delicious patch of moss. point to that. And then they would have contest winners Alone like this. large mammals, reindeer are known to take victory naps. Well done, Bailey. <laughs> so you get a sale. So um, there was a lot of stuff behind the scenes that I can't really talk about, but uh, this wasn't as complex as they made it seem. <laughs> Those were not all our engineers, by the way. Um, 
So around this, actually, at the exact same time, um, two projects were going on. Uh, we, uh, we were in LA and we built a holiday card. This was a two-day project. So the idea was um, we wanted to create a holiday card that was fun, interactive, and originally was just designed for uh, Toyota, for one client. Um, we ended up sort of just uh, launching it in collaboration with Saatchi and Saatchi. Uh, they're a, a really interesting ad agency, does a lot of work primarily for Toyota. We, we work with them a lot out of Los Angeles. They made this project really interesting. What this was, was taking the concept of beer pong. I don't know if you know eggnog pong. And honestly, I will say, I went to CMU. I never played beer pong in my life. Um, I'm not opposed to it, but you know, I just didn't understand it all. So anyhow, this is uh, eggnog pong. Get a ball in a cup, someone drinks it. Uh, it goes to charity, every ball that goes in the cup. We built a website so that people could log in, control a little ping pong ball shooter that we just sort of hacked apart controlled with an Arduino board, and you shot a ball. Um, the interesting thing was the whole time you were playing against ad, ad industry people, and they were interacting with you. They were reading your name off. They were taunting you. They were teasing you. Um, this project started with no press at all, just sort of um, sent it out to a few people on a mailing list, and had uh, you know 900 people in line in a matter of minutes, had a couple thousand likes, did really well. This is sort of the machine being built. Um, and I'll show you a couple videos associated with this thing. It's a two-day hack job. This is what it uh, looked like on news reports. Guest 4484. Okay, what do you get when you mix a game of beer pong with a little holiday cheer? You get something called Nog Pong. Big ad agency in the South Bay has created the online interactive game. Sachi and Sachi is the agency. On the website, users aim a virtual ping pong cannon and then just fire away. So on the other end of the interactive site sits what is known as the knob bot, like in robot, who's charged with sinking your shot, sink a shot, and the employees get to enjoy another nogging. The site lasts officially, well, the last official day is tomorrow. It's from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. tomorrow. All the money raised here goes to charity. Okay, where is the cannon? We look like we're watching an office party. <laughs> that starts very early and ends very late. They lied. There is no cannon. Those guys are just tossing them back for hours. There's nothing crazier than a group of people with egg dog. Got <laughs> a lot of time on their hands. <laughs> okay, so um, this is just, I'm going to show you a little bit of B-roll from it. Let's turn this down. A lot of things came out of this. They produced a song that came out from people just sort of playing there. But this is sort of what you saw. The setup was pretty, pretty slim, pretty bare. Went through 52 gallons of liquor. <laughs> um, which is a lot, and uh, ended up being a pretty interesting project that was done pretty quickly. I'll let you see some of these shots and I'll probably move along. But people would wait in line for hours. I don't know. Did any of you see this at all? You heard? It was just, just self-promotion. Self yeah, yeah, it was just a holiday card, yeah, basically. Um, it, it, uh, it did really well. It got picked up by blogs like Not Caught and stuff. And, um, was seen in like 62 different countries, 20 million impressions, did really well for something that was thrown together, had a, you know, a very small budget, a few thousand dollar budget. Um, I show you all those number statistics because that's really important for these things. I, we don't do any of that measurement, I should say, by the way. It's always done by the agencies we collaborate with or the brands or people who specialize in that. But it does come down to a, something that we have to always worry about with our work, that it has to actually generate some revenue at the end of the day. I like to think that we're just making art projects, and you know, usually we get to, but it has to be compelling enough that, um, that you can make the argument that it's generating some real revenue. Um, but honestly, if you look at the cost spend, I don't know if you guys know what a TV commercial costs, but TV commercials are like you know, $8 million just to shoot, and then you go buy your media time, and that's a lot more. Um, so it's pretty expensive. So when you look at campaigns like this, we're in a really interesting position because we don't have to get the number of views that a TV commercial has. We can do less, and we're still a huge success. 
Um, this project was uh, last for the World Cup last year. We produced two projects at the same time. And I, I'm proud of this because I'm proud of like my team because it's just that um, you know, the, we were working on two projects for two different clients for the start of the World Cup, and we had six people employed at the company at the time. And the fact one engineer had to fly to Los Angeles to operate this project while he was supporting code that was launching in Johannesburg, South Africa. <laughs> so literally, he was up at 3 or 4 in the morning working on stuff. He was up for about 50 hours straight. Um, not this engineer, though. <laughs> so this is a project called um, Balls to the Brits, Balls to the Yanks, not our name. Uh, the idea was to create a system that would allow people to send taunts back and forth in real time from Los Angeles uh, to London. So in Leicester Square, London, and then in City Walk in LA, people would send messages in, basically saying, screw you England, or we're going to trump you US. Those messages would go out to uh, this robot sort of machine that we built using an industrial print head and would print on the circumference of a ball and then spit out of a billboard at a crowd. So your message to London would spit out in London. Your message to the US would spit out in LA. Um, it's kind of theatrical, involved a couple celebrities. Um, Adam Sandberg was used, at, but this is just a EA sort of Sports video spot right for it. Caveat that this is not a good video. This was for EA Sports, by the way. USA. 2-1. 2-1. Alright, USA. All day, every day. Go USA. USA. Hoorah! You submit your trash talk through an iPad. It's sent over to London where it's printed out on a soccer ball. It's blasted out of the side of the screen. And then their MC is going to read the trash talk that we submit. And we're doing it vice versa. It's a two-way street. They're talking trash to us. We're talking trash to them. USA and England is going to lock it. All right, you get the idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, some of the, I can't talk about details of some of these projects, especially on camera, but you know, some projects are good and some are bad. And some get confusing and some are built when an iPad is released and clients get excited. <laughs> and um, iPads must be involved. Uh, <laughs> this project, uh, at the same time we built, it was a lot more clever. And this, uh, again, really simple technology. We built a system uh, for a Write the Future campaign, which basically allowed kids in 20, 20 or so different countries and 16 different languages to send in messages predicting who was going to win tomorrow's soccer game, basically writing the headline of tomorrow's soccer match. <coughs> Those messages would appear on the side of the Life Center building, one of the tallest buildings in Johannesburg, South Africa. They'd animate into the player's face that the, uh, the user sort of selected who they thought was going to win. Um, and then that animation would uh, have a photograph taken of it sent back to the user, similar to, to Chalkbot in this way. The building itself was equipped with um, LED strips, so really long strips down the seams of the building. There was a controller built for that. We worked with a company from South Africa uh, on the installation of those LEDs. And then we built <coughs> a software mechanic that basically allowed people to send in messages over. One was a Facebook application, but the other way was mostly over uh, different social networks. In China, it was QQ. In South Africa, it was Mixit. Uh, that whole system was built in four weeks, deployed very quickly, and operated during the whole World Cup. What's interesting about this is that Nike wasn't an official, this was for Nike Global. Nike Global was not an official sponsor of the World Cup. Uh, who is it? Uh, Adidas is the official sponsor of the World Cup, which means there are some pretty big restrictions around ad advertising uh, if you're not paying a ton of money to, uh, to FIFA. So what they did was this building was right outside of the no advertising perimeter, but it was tall enough that it was sort of seen by everyone. Um, so the peer building appeared in backdrops and photographs from National Geographic, all of the magazine spread. So they essentially crashed the World Cup, and by the end of it, everyone thought that Nike was the official sponsor, and no one even remembered that Adidas was, I mean, Adidas made the soccer balls. That's pretty much what people thought. This one's up for a number of awards right now. I'll show you Kobe so Bryant. Let's see. Now I'm sending a message to the most exciting team in the world, to my homies in Brazil. I think I'm going to issue a challenge. Ratio to six.
amazing. I've never quite seen anything like that. Uh, I put a message up to Brazil. Obviously, it'll be their sixth championship here, and I'm hopefully going for a six next year. So it's, uh, it's a nice little challenge. Voila. All right, so I'll put an, uh, another one on just in the background here that you can see. But this campaign is now up for a lot of awards. We, we've done well in sort of the awards world of, of the advertising industry. So the Chalkbox campaign I mentioned really did trigger a lot of other uh, agencies trying to start to build physical objects. Um, we were just in New York because it was just named one of the top ten uh, digital campaigns of the decade, number six overall, which is great for our little company from Pittsburgh. Ad agencies, if you don't know, are very, very big, like thousands and thousands of people. 65%, I think, of every product spend is spent on advertising that product. So there is a ridiculous amount of money um, involved. So uh, big companies. For our little company in Pittsburgh to be able to do that is, uh, is interesting. Um, so you see some of this stuff. This application had... Um, Close to 300,000 downloads in a matter of about a week of the Facebook application, which was pretty good. You can see the, you know, our little drawing of the Life Center building being outside the no sponsor perimeter. Um, and only, you know, really only 3,500 people were able to participate. It was hard to get all this stuff um, you know, up on a building. You have a limited amount of time. Um, so that's actually all the work I was going to show you. Um, right now, what we're working on is one project that hopefully will take place at CMU this summer. Uh, with a major car company. We'll see about that. Um, we're trying to really involve CMU in it. Uh, one thing that's been, I just spoke about last night that's been really exciting for us is that when we started doing this type of work, it was really hard to convince our clients to do anything in Pittsburgh or give or care what Pittsburgh, where Pittsburgh was. We had clients that really did think when we said Pittsburgh that we were Philadelphia. <laughs> when we did the Reindeer Project, it was um, with, you know, San Francisco Gap. Um, we said, you know, we wanted to find a reindeer farm near Pittsburgh, and they found a reindeer farm in Minnesota and said that, there you go, here's one near Pittsburgh. <laughs> Outside of California, it does not count as like just near us. So we had to spend minus 30, it was minus 30 degrees at the time. It was when the roof collapsed on, the, um, on that Packers stadium out there. Uh, or no, so the Viking stadium. Sorry, I'm thinking Super Bowl. Um, so it was when the roof collapsed. And we, had to, we basically had to stay in the farmer's house. A um, really nice guy named Daryl. We stayed in his house and, uh, was for that really about a week. The, uh, video uh, <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> There's some magic that happens at some point. That's a that's a good-looking zoologist. But um, no, they uh, there's there's some, <laughs> some things we lose control of at certain points, and um, that might be one of those things. But uh, for the most part, you know, one once in a while, like Chalkbot is a rare exception. With that project, we were given. Honestly, because the client did not believe that that machine was going to actually get built, we were given so much freedom, we had almost no oversight. The ad agency that we worked with flew out once. The first test printing that we did was in my backyard. It's still in my alleyway. Um, so we printed and got my neighbors to approve, to let, although my neighbors moved, and I have new neighbors now who wondered what's in my alley. And I had to explain to them. They thought it was Sanskrit. I said, no, that's Chalkbot's first messages. Um, but so basically, we were able to do all this stuff with almost no approval. Um, since we've gotten more credibility, it's actually gotten worse. So now we have a lot more approval process. We have a lot more involvement from the client. Um, and it's just like anything else. It's just like product development, um, where most people think they know how to build things or how to accomplish things. And I uh, think the idea is hard and the building is simple. Um, so I mean, we have all these challenges that, that anyone has, or even when we, when we build products, we have. Um, but you know, what we've been able to do now is convince our clients uh, to really start doing more production work here in Pittsburgh. So every project we're working on this year, the making of, sort of the construction of, the fabrication of, has become content. So that's almost, in some cases, more interesting. Like I would argue the EA Sports thing, if we had done more video of us building it, was more interesting than the thing. Um, so that's becoming useful to clients as well, as they want every company on earth, if you, if you really think, I used to be very, it's fun, I used to make projects that were very cr critical of advertising campaigns, I guess. So it's interesting with advertising to sit back and try to be really, uh, really conscious of what you're watching. You realize every car company is now innovative. Like there is a certain word that's sort of pushed around with every brand. Every car company we talk to is innovation right now. And um, you realize, how can everything be innovation? There was a time when everything was revolution, right? Uh, 
Washington Mutual had uh, Che Guevara images to sell low finance charge checking accounts. It was like, ah, oh, it's a revolution. Um, it's not a revolution. It's a bank and it's checking accounts. So, you know, if you realize that absurdity, you know, it, it actually frees you because we still realize that absurdity. What we try to do now is just make something that's that's clever and fun. Can you talk again about the turnaround time? You mentioned oh, yeah. some, it was like a matter of weeks. I think you said. Yeah, everything's been before. so. Chalkbot was literally seven weeks. So seven weeks from here's the idea to putting it on. Uh, actually, that one had to be. Um, that had to be flown because it took so long. Uh, but it was it, lots of things were cool about that. So it was flown at the last minute to England. We couldn't get approval to get it into France. We couldn't also, the, we built it faster than the state of Pennsylvania would license the trailer because the trailer was physically made as well, welded from scratch. So just so you know, the DMV takes about, I think, eight weeks to get a tra uh, handmade trailer registration. So my boat trailer is handmade. So that's what went on the chalk bot and is in all these videos is my boat trailer because it's a handmade trailer license for Pennsylvania. So then we had to drive it and boat it from uh, England to France. And yeah, uh, it came back on a boat. Do you have some experience with that? I mean, are, are you, you don't have to divulge yeah. anything that would get you in trouble, especially on tape, but uh, <laughs> um, remember Graffiti Bot? Oh, Graffiti Writer, yeah, yeah, of course. Was that, was that you or your team? No, well, the engineer that worked on this um, yeah. is also the engineer that built the original Graffiti Writer as well. Okay. So Greg Baltus, fantastic mechanical engineer, if you know him, but he runs a company called Standard Robot. The Chalkbot has since been licensed to Greg. Greg retained all the intellectual property to that. And there's a company now called American Road Printing that started up here in Pittsburgh that now is making these as a product line. So after the Chalkbot happened, we got a lot of calls from marathons and road races and stuff like that. So um, yeah, I'm happy that Greg was involved with that originally and involved with it now. But that's, you know, that always results in when art becomes business, it's a little scary. <laughs> I think a lot of people in this world still have this bizarre sort of interest in ad busters. And that oh, yeah, that's great. Even though they work in the industry, and I assume that's what you're hinting at yourself. Oh, it's, I mean, I think that it's, it's I think you have to, I mean, what we're working on, there, there are limits to what we would do, right? I'm not like I'm selling my, my soul for what I'm doing. Um, my goal is the same as it was when I ran an art group. When I ran an art group, um, my goal was just to be able to like do projects that interested me, create really cool things, think critically about the world around me, and be with a group of people that I like to work with. The challenge I had, and this is sort of the thing that's never talked about in art, is I, I was exhibiting a lot internationally, and the challenge really was that there was no money there. I may have worked in a collective, which I did, but whenever it came time for someone to go lecture, it was me that got flown around. If, it was a, if there was a name chosen for something, it was my name. Right? One person got all the credit. My collaborators, there was no money, so my collaborators were basically working for free out of the goodness of their heart, right? To be involved in something cool. And that has a life, like that dies at some point. I mean, there's a challenge there. You get to a point of wanting, how do you create a sustainable arts practice? And I think that I've actually, um, I talk to a lot of artists now about that. Like, how do you create a practice where you can work for yourself? Is it better if I go and work for Nike directly? Or is it, or can I sort of be autonomous myself and create my own um, company this way? And, and that's what we try to do is just say, we have no bosses. Um, I sort of count as the boss, but we get to dictate our day. We just started a program, as a reminder of this, we were on a trip down to DC a couple of days ago and uh, our lead engineer and I just thought about it in the car and said, you know, winters suck in Pittsburgh and I travel a lot, but a lot of people don't get to at the company and we have people who left San Francisco to come to Pittsburgh and you know, how do we keep them excited? So we started this work anywhere program, which we just said, okay, we're gonna create this thing. You can go work wherever you want and we'll pay for your flight and we'll pay for your hotel for up to two weeks. So if you decide you want to go work in New Orleans, you can. There's some limits I'm not talking about, but there's some limits. But the idea really is get out of Pittsburgh, go work somewhere else. If you're on a project that you can go put your head down somewhere else, go put it down somewhere else. Your weekend's yours, your evenings are yours, go try to do something interesting somewhere else. And that's something like we try to, when you have a company, it's weird. I think that um, every startup I know in Pittsburgh somehow believes they have to build their company around a, a, this fictitious model of what a business is supposed to be. And they forget that they can do anything they want. They, you can do anything you want. You can choose to work out of your basement. You can choose to work two days a week. Like there's nothing that's restricting you. But the cost of business around here, I assume it's much, much less. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. I mean, I could never so have done. You can offer that benefit. To oh, yeah, yeah. And I mean, we take, um, we've benefited from a lot of things in, in, uh, in Pittsburgh. I think that we've, I think that we, we love staying here, so we're going to stay here, but we need to make, most of our clients aren't in Pittsburgh, and that's, that's a challenge, I think. You know, starting a, creating a startup in Pittsburgh has tons of challenges, and I interact a lot with the startup community here and talk to them about those challenges, but one of the biggest things I've learned 
that I think we do really well, um, that I'm surprised I do really well, is sales and marketing. It's the side of starting a company that no one wants to really talk about. But you realize that it doesn't matter what you're building if no one really knows what you're building. And then you'll just be angry for a while because someone else in San Francisco will build the same thing and get press. And you realize that you know, it's, it's your job to let other people know that they should even care. And then realize no one has any attention span at all. And, um, and you have to deal with that. You know, it's your challenge. So I mean, I think that that's, that's something that while we don't have some big sales and marketing team, we have myself and then we have a marketing director. Um, that's become a lot of what my job is. I get to build stuff. I got to build some circuits for Nogbot, Nogpong, Nogbot. But, um, but typically, my job is sort of conceptual development and QuickBooks, which I've come to love <laughs> as much as you can love QuickBooks and accounting. Do you guys maintain the blog departments? Maintain what? A blog, like sort of like stepping through some of the thought processes. Not as much as we should. Well, uh, <laughs> you do it so fast, though, it's not like you even have that. Yeah, we, we've that. tried to get better at being more open about what we do um, and showing the process a little bit more. But honestly, it's become something that we, uh, we failed at a lot, even documenting our own process. It's just like I failed as an artist documenting my process over and over again, and half that work's disappeared. But now it's the same thing. I mean, it's, it's hard to find that time, but we're trying to um, actually contract with a few people to help us with that. And we, we have an event. Uh, I talked about our artist residency program. The interesting thing about that is it's not a technology residency program. It's called Old and New Media. And we do it in collaboration with a group called Encyclopedia Destructica, which is a basically bookbinding art collective, very traditional, whereas we're sort of the, the more new media side of things. So people can propose concepts. It's on a rolling basis. We've had, I think, three artists go through it already. They propose con uh, projects that they want to work on. The only requirement is the technology. They can't know how to accomplish it themselves. It can't be something that they already know how to do. And it's got to involve both old and new media. There has to be something traditional done about it in the project, as well as something new. We don't want just visualization projects or where we're going to sit down and code. We want to do something that's tangible. So, um, and we think that's what's interesting, is that collision between stuff. So we've had some success with the projects that came out of those. I think, you know, and we hope to c continue that for a while. But um, we also, as a part of that, we work a lot with, or we used to do a lot more work with nonprofits and local organizations. And you run into an issue as your burn rate goes up and all this stuff that it becomes harder. There's sort of a mismatch uh, of you know how much you need to operate, you know, basically per hour, and how much another organization is able to pay. Um, and that becomes a challenge when you're working locally. So we, instead of charging uh, people to do that work, we created this event called Waffle Wednesday that's basically open office hours. Um, the original goal was just free consulting. You want to come in. Most problems that people come to us with that they want meetings for locally can be solved by just pointing people in the right direction. I mean, typically, a lot of the people that come to us are just looking for some product that already exists, and they just need to know it already exists. They don't need to pay us to build something. So if they can come in and learn that in 20 minutes, it saves them going and writing a grant or doing whatever they're going to do to try to try to find this stuff. So for three hours, about once a month, we make waffles. We thought we'd like try to try to sweeten it a little bit, sweeten the deal. So come in, you get free waffles. It's free to come in. And um, you can talk to any of our staff. We're all there. And you get coffee and waffles. We, um, we usually get a really big mix of startups, people from startups. We've had investors, um, artists. We had a puppeteer the last couple times. I mean, people from very different disciplines that come and mingle. And now they, a lot of people use it as uh, networking opportunities. But we get a lot, because we're sort of a random uh, company of sort of randomness, we get a lot of people that come in with cool ideas, actually, their own product ideas or their own software ideas or whatever it might be. And they just want feedback. So they just come in, show it to us. We give them some feedback. It's like, it's, it's a lot easier than going into like the meeting mode. But we got into a point, we started that because I got into a point where I'm really bad at saying no to people. And I started to just be in meeting after meeting, like driving around the city. And I, you know, it, it's just, it's tough. So I said, okay, I'm gonna make everyone come to us. It'll be easier. We'll just make some waffles. It was good. So I have a question from the technology perspective. Yep. And I know that there are limits on what you're allowed to say. <laughs> um, I heard the word Arduino. Yeah. <laughs> um, are there suggestions you have with respect to students who might be considering hacking something together quickly mm -hmm. in terms of fast, fast development kind of? I love that Arduino exists now. I mean, like when I, that first robot you saw, I mean, I, and the Game Boy stuff, you know, that was all done in the era of, of parallel port programming, right? That was what you did. And um, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not, actually, I'm not a big Arduino user, but the other guys at the shop are. And that's basically because it's 
really easy to work with. You have limits. It's like anything else. There are limits. But for basic prototyping, for making a robot that has three motors, turn, you know, turn one servo and two DC motors, it's a perfect way to get that going in, in no time at all. So I mean, I love that that exists. Um, I, I love that things like Instructables exist now. I mean, I love that there's even a, there's such a huge maker movement. They're never, you know, I'm trying to think back to my year, but 12, 13 years ago, when you were making stuff, um, you had to make, I mean, for me as an artist, I had to learn everything from scratch. I had to like figure out how to make all this stuff. And I used to complain because I taught a few classes here, and it was funny because this is actually the downside of all of this. So it's great that there are a lot of packages and there's an open source hardware movement, and I think that that's fantastic for prototyping. It's not efficient. Chalkbot is not run on Arduino, so there's like limits, right? But it's great for prototyping. Um, when I was teaching a class, it was an interdisciplinary class and a class where kids had to make stuff. And I had students that would come up with ideas and then come up to me, and this was in the age of like ADB IO boards, and they would tell me, well, I could do this project that I want to do where people walk around a space and sound is triggered in different locations, but I need this $280 ADB IO board, I need, and they listed out their parts. They said, so it'll cost me $2,000, so I can't really do it. And I said, you know, this is the downside of people feeling like the, the solution is prepackaged for them. If you really want, you know, when I built, uh, I had interactive installation years ago at the brew house where you would walk around a space and trigger sound, and it was done with endless loop cassettes and cassette players from the thrift store, and two pieces of copper and foam to create you know, resistance. Yeah, there it is. Pressure sensors underground with audio triggered based on your motion in, in a space, right? It's like you can do this for nothing, but like, I think that that's the problem when we have too many package solutions. I think it's happened a lot in graphic design as well, where if you have too many package solutions, people look first to that solution, and they say, well, if Arduino can't do it, I guess it can't be done. I'm like, no, 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 you can figure it out. Just maybe it's not done in that same way. But for certain things, I think it's fantastic. Yeah. When you guys prototype the, the, the street yeah. chalker or any of them, I'm, I'm curious about what, what the client actually can come to you. Like, did they come to you with 10 crazy ideas and you whittle them down to the one or two that maybe you thought you could turn around? They came to us with, um, for Widen and in the case of Widen and Kennedy for the Nike chalkbot, they came to us with a pretty good notion of what they wanted. They said, basically, we, want, um, we know that Nike was already a sponsor of the Tour de France. They were already paying some millions of dollars to have a presence there. And they knew that rather than just have banners and people selling bracelets, um, they wanted to do something else. Yeah. They actually, social, 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 social. Yeah, I mean, well, everything, it, it's funny. I mean, uh, people follow trends really quickly. But that actually came out of the work I'd done previously. So a lot of that work with Graffiti Writer uh, that um, was not done by me, it was done by friends, was, was seen by uh, ad agencies and things. And actually, it, the, the agent, the, we never worked in advertising before Chalkbot. We just made stuff. Um, I had a, uh, I used to be in this punk that band. That was the first one. Yeah. I used to be in a punk band years ago, um, and that's actually how we got into accidentally into <laughs> advertising. So I used to scream in this band, and uh, I, uh, we toured at one point with uh, a kid who went on 12 years later to become uh, creative at an ad agency, Wyden and Kennedy. This kid knew about uh, a lot of the work that we had done. I showed you those things, but we used to do little hack workshops. So we'd travel around with my band. All the lyrics were very nerdy and about soldering irons and things. And then we would actually do little workshops. And we'd teach people hands-on how to take things apart. We'd do like disposable camera hacks and turn them into projectors. And it was just trying to get people involved in taking things apart. And that was like sort of mid-90s. And this kid knew me from back in that age. And I hadn't talked to him in about a decade. And I got a call at the office saying, you know, hey, I remember this project graffiti writer. And they said, we're going to the tour. And asked, you know, what we were doing. Knew that we were working in mobile development primarily and asked us to basically what could we come up with for the tour? And so we actually pitched three ideas. Um, so that came from you guys. You had mentioned earlier that sometimes they come to you with all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah, and that one was more of a, that was more of a, here's a crazy idea, can it happen? Gotcha. Um, and we didn't know a lot of, we had no idea how the ad industry worked at that point. Um, like we didn't know that, that this almost didn't happen. We didn't know other budgets were being cut. Nike was going through layoffs at the time. Right. There was crazy stuff That's going really, on. I mean, you can't give away numbers, I know, but you mentioned eight, ten million dollars yeah. for but if you come along and do something, I'll just start a number, $200,000. Yeah. To them, that must be like... It's nothing. <laughs> yeah, it's nothing. We're cheap. <laughs> so, I mean, it's actually, we don't pitch ourselves as being cheap, but it's, um, but it is, it's to our benefit. Because honestly, there's a lot of risk with projects like this. If you think about yourself as a perspective of a person working in marketing, it's the same as the old adage about no one got fired for buying Microsoft. If you go out and you pitch another TV commercial, and you go shoot that TV commercial, and you spend your $3 million, and wow, it's not an amazing TV commercial, but you're still going to get your viewers. Someone watched it. 
they're still going to count those same charts and say we had 40 million views and each view cost me 2.3 cents and that no one will get fired basically if you go and you build a robot that you has to go to france and that robot can break that robot could malfunction it could hurt someone it could it could there's all kinds of things that can happen so now you're asking someone who um, who's typically really risk averse to take on a lot of risk um, with the hope that what they're going to do is going to be the next big thing um, for example the uh, the ea sports project there were some missteps along the way. I guess I shouldn't finish this story, but people lose their jobs sometimes for, um, for miscues when you're in risky situations. Mm -hmm. Not at my company, um, but people can lose their jobs in that world very, very quickly. Um, so taking a risk is, is hard in that world. I feel like that's why you see a lot of the same ad campaigns, because it's, it's and you, once you see one good ad campaign, Wyden and Kennedy worked on the Old Spice campaign as well at the same time that won a lot of awards. Yeah. And now you'll, see, you'll start to see a lot more commercials that mimic that. You'll see a lot more commercials of a guy walking through several different scenes. I saw three uh, different brands doing the same thing. And that's just what, you, because the clients, remember the, cli the brand is the one dictating all this. The brand saying, that Old Spice commercial was really cool. Make me something like that. <laughs> and, that and really, it doesn't matter how creative you get. Chalkbot's the same thing. We had a lot of people come to us and say, that Chalkbot's cool. Make me one. <laughs> we go, well, that's great, but that's Nike associated, and that means that forever that's going to carry the brand of Nike. If Adidas makes a chalkbot, it's going to be the Adidas Nike chalkbot. So you can't, you can't get around it. But I think that's hard for an industry that isn't really about innovation. Um, it's, it's not. So, I mean, they have to find. Yeah, it's about job security like anything else. I mean, you need to get eyeballs. Um, but, anyhow. So, are there other questions? I have one last question. <laughs> Brian, go for it. <laughs> we'll just leave it at. I'm curious uh, who you look to for inspiration mm -hmm. in terms of other companies of similar size. Yeah. Um, <coughs> we're lucky to have both of them talk to us. I'm just curious oh, yeah. which ones around the country maybe that uh, you would want to give a shout out to if you. I'm trying to figure that out. Um, or are you guys so unique in that way? We're, I don't want to say we're so unique. I think in the industry we're in, we're pretty unique. I think that we keep finding out more about companies that exist that are, um, there was a company that just shut down in London called Tinker, which was really cool. Um, see a couple guys from Tinker write a lot of Arduino books. They were doing, they did some stuff with National Geographic, with the BBC, just little gimmicky stuff. Um, there were some projects that were done with Volkswagen, I can't remember who actually worked on these, called the Fun Theory, which were super simple technology projects that I thought were great. It would be like, okay, how do I convince someone to, um, to pick up litter? Well, you convince them to pick up litter by creating a musical recycle bin or a musical trash can. How do you convince them to use the steps rather than the escalator? Well, you make the steps musical, right? And it's really interesting, simple interactions. They're just based around fun. And now they've had a few other things go on with um, like traffic lights. They did a traffic light project. Uh, this is somewhere in Europe where you could, um, if you, how did this work? Basically, you were rewarded for traveling under the, you would enter a lottery if you traveled under the speed limit through an intersection. And then there was a winner every day that won some money. <laughs> so rather than punishing the speeders, you were only able to enter if you traveled under the speed limit. Like really simple ideas. Yeah, cool stuff. And I, that's, you know, why I tell you I don't know who did that is typically in the advertising industry, the company that did that is you'll never know. We're a really rare case. We were the first company that Nike ever mentioned in a press release by name. So we've taken that and run with it as far as we can um, because it's just rare. I mean, typically that would be math and you would think that was Nike. You get credit in com arts and that's it. Yeah, well, usually you don't even, you know, you'll get a line, right, somewhere, right. production, deep local. So I mean, we've benefited in that everyone we work with now we are treat, treats us with a lot of respect, treats us as collaborators, gives us the credit, uh, to the point where we just finished shooting a project for, um, for a car company. I, don't, uh, I think it airs soon. But they basically invited us to go do whatever we wanted in, uh, in California, basically submit an art project. And they would film us making whatever it was we wanted to make. And then turn, and we did have to drive around in certain vehicles the whole time. But <laughs> other than that, we got to do whatever we wanted, do this little art project. And then they filmed this sort of making of thing, had a production crew travel with us and basically make a commercial, which is great because they're basically saying that our brand has value enough that it can be content. And that's what we've worked really hard to do is say, like, this stuff we're doing, we're really trying to get a, a, develop a brand for it. And that brand then becomes something that allows us to not just be a vendor that you come to to go build some hardware. We really want to be a team of creatives. So, a lot of the projects we're working with now this year aren't necessarily 
directly advertising related. We're working on content development for um, some TV stations and things. So same thing, like how do you start to get into doing more interactive stuff that's interesting? I mean, I love it right now because I feel like I can recreate every art project I ever did or wanted to do in the mid-90s, except suddenly there are a shitload of people online and there's more bandwidth and like, I mean, there were projects done on a CMU. When I, when I was here, was, I graduated in 99 in art. And we had the first robotic arts professor in the world, Simon Penny. And I studied under people like Simon Penny and uh, um, uh, Steve Kurtz, who we had a group called Critical Art and Ensemble, like great people doing really amazing stuff. There were things where you could call into a cable access show. A friend, Peter, uh, uh, Peter Coppin, did a project where you could call into a cable access, PCTV, and use a cell phone to press keys and, and shock a person in real time, right? I mean, ridiculous, but how interesting is that? And how interesting, I mean, I remember sitting here and coming to a lecture of Ken Goldberg, who did the Telegarden. I came to one of these robotics lectures years ago and saw this Telegarden project that I tell ad agencies and brands about, and they're amazed. Like, I have no idea what, what I'm talking about. Like, this was done in, like, 1993, where you could plant a seed and water it, and this is amazing. And um, I don't know, I feel like there's this incredible thing about to happen where all these great projects can now come to life. And uh, the nice thing that I have is I can actually pay my collaborators. We can all do well. Um, we can make decisions together whether we want to work on a project or not. Um, and yeah, we can feel comfortable about it while doing it. I mean, we, we think a lot about ethics whenever we're making decisions about anything, and um, we're able to do that because we have no, we have, we have a board of directors. I'm the only member of it. Um, <laughs> so that's a, that's a good thing to strive for. <laughs> OK. That's my head. Yep. Be your own board of directors. Feel free, to, feel free to come up and bother him afterwards. <laughs> Yeah, and you all should come to Waffle Wednesday. Yeah. Uh, honestly. What's that? When's the next one? We just had one on Wednesday, so probably, <laughs> probably in another three weeks. I'm going on a vacation soon, so it'll be like two weeks away at least. But if you go to deeplocal.com, you can see a lot of our videos. We do have some videos of our process stuff, and you can, there, I think there's a Google Calendar of all of our public events that we do. We're trying to start doing a lot more public events as well. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening.